you can't be a vigilante because it's frankly illegal. So you're not Batman. Honestly, you probably shouldn't intervene. But what if you have to? When should you intervene? Or when should you answer a challenge? There are a couple of scenarios where things start making a little bit of sense. The first thing that we have to cover is legal self-defense. Now look, I need you to understand that legal self-defense is not my domain. I teach people how to fight. I have a resources page on my website that has links to people who are actually subject matter experts like Mark McYoung and Rory Miller and Andrew Branca and some others. And it is very, very important that you get up to speed on the legal stuff and legal depends on whatever jurisdiction you are under. Now, we all know that legal doesn't equal moral and you have to make those decisions for yourself, but understand that consequences come with acting outside of the law. And that being said, there are consequences uh, for anybody who encourages people to act outside the law. So I'm not going to encourage you to act outside the law. That being said, right, obviously in legal self-defense, now for something to be considered legal self-defense, right, uh, you know, Rory Miller, and look, this is not exclusively his thing. He's just the one that I first learned it from. Um, as a general rule, this is a rule of thumb. This is not precise legal advice. And not a thing in this is legal advice, okay? Um, you have to be able to demonstrate before the authorities that whoever you are engaging with in an act of self-defense had the means to attack or assault, whatever, had the opportunity to do so, and had the intent to do, do so. The intersection of those three things matters a lot, right? Because if somebody has the intent and the opportunity, but not the means, well, then they're not going to be an effective assailant and you are not going to be able to respond to them in any reasonable way. If they have the means and the opportunity, but no intent, well, then it doesn't matter, right? Because if they don't intend to cause harm and they are not actively threatening you or anything like that, well, then the, their ability to harm you and their being in proximity to you in a way that would afford them the ability to harm you doesn't matter because they are not intent on harming you, right? That matters a lot. And, you know, and it's the same thing where if they have the means and the intent to harm you, but they don't have the opportunity, well, then again, it doesn't matter because they're never afforded the opportunity to actually carry out what they're capable of doing and want to do. So it, the intersection of those three things matters a whole lot. So if somebody does not have means, opportunity, intent, you really have no standing for legal self-defense. Now, the other side of it that we have to look at, now I pulled this from Andrew Branca. Um, and look, you can, you can get his book for basically for free. I think you just have to pay shipping. That's how I got it. Um, and then, uh, and he's, a um, he's actually a self-defense lawyer and that's just what he does. Right. So as opposed to like Miller and McYoung who are on the other side of things, you know, the, the enforcement side of things or whatever, uh, Breck is actually in the courtrooms, you know, working these cases as a lawyer. Um, and, uh, this comes from a free little, uh, chart that he, that he does. I think you can even order it as a poster. Um, but Number one, for you to be able to claim self-defense is you need to be innocent. That means that you did not engage in inciting the thing. You did not kick off the thing. Um, it doesn't mean they attacked you first, but it does mean that you did not do anything to, uh, you know, to create the inciting incident. Um, imminence. Again, the imminence goes back to this. This means opportunity intent, right? If you don't have imminence in this, you don't have a case. Avoidance, right? In most places, you have a duty to try to avoid, right? And that actually feeds right back into the innocence part. If you did not try to avoid the conflict, it's hard to claim innocence, right? Because it's going to look like you sought out or at least, uh, you know, advanced or escalated it, right? And that goes into the whole de-escalation side of things. Um, 
reasonableness. You have to respond to the threat in a way that would be, and this is from a legal standpoint, that would be considered reasonable by a jury of your peers. If your response to a threat would not be considered reasonable by this theoretical jury of your peers, we can argue about, you know, how reasonable the idea of a jury of your peers even is. Um, but that idea of reasonableness is a very, very solid thing that gets applied in courtrooms. So, you know, you have to be shown to be basically like, would a normal person react this way? That's a pretty, um, that's a, that's a pretty tough one, right? And then proportionality. Um, and, and essentially proportionality just means that you don't get to use lethal force if they did not have the means, opportunity, intent to also use lethal force. If you cannot demonstrate that they were using lethal force, then you can't use lethal force. It does go down the line of escalation. That's a pretty important one. Um, and here's the thing, uh, you know, we can, we can actually look at the rules of escalation. I didn't, I didn't pull them up for this, but we can look at the rules of escalation for military and law enforcement. And there are steps that they go through. I'll include those on the sub stack. Um, but there are steps that they have to go through to escalate the level of force, right? There's a use of force continuum that has to be applied and again, because you're dealing with things like the Geneva Convention and the law and stuff like that, there are standards of behavior that are applied that have real consequences in the real world, regardless of how you feel about those things. There are standards with consequences that will be applied against you, whether you consent to them or not. And again, we can argue the morality, we can argue the ethics, we, we can actually lobby for change, but the immediate fact is that we are subject to these, whether we like them or not. And so proportionality, right, and following this idea of your um, escalation of force continuum, that's going to be a pretty important concept, right? So the other side of it, right, that's self-defense. The other side of it, right, because we're talking like, Batman here, what about intervening on somebody else's behalf? This becomes very, very important. When are you allowed to protect somebody? Now, let's let's not get something twisted here, right? At some point, you are going to find yourself just having to make a decision and just dealing with the consequences. That is a fact. But there are two main points, as far as I'm concerned, that you need to know in order to correctly, ethically, step in and intervene and defend somebody who you would consider an innocent. Number one is you have to know the full picture. If you do not legally have the authority to, uh, you know, arrest and detain people and break up a fight and have legal use of force authorization and stuff like that, i.e., you know, being a, a, some kind of cop or security officer, um, if you don't have those, then, then you don't have a safety net in case you get it wrong, right? Now, I'm not even arguing that you should have a safety net. I think qualified immunity is actually a huge problem. But if you don't know the full picture, why are you intervening? You could be intervening on the aggressor's behalf just because the situation appears to be something other than what it is. You could be stepping into a situation that has threatening variables that you are unaware of. And that's a problem too, right? So you could be risking your safety. You could be risking the safety of the others involved. You could be actually escalating a situation that would have resolved itself. That's a problem. There are so many problems with intervening when you do not have the full story. This is one of the reasons why it is really difficult to make any determinations on like cell phone or security cam footage about things because oftentimes we don't get the full start to finish of the entire scenario. In fact, most of the time we don't get that. And so it is really, really important for you to know the full picture. And if you don't have the full picture, it's probably not a good idea for you to in intervene. And again, because if nothing else, you could be risking your own safety or escalating things in a way that would not have happened otherwise. So even if you don't care about the legal side of it, just the fact that you could be increasing risk and escalation is kind of a, a ward a, against intervening if you don't have full knowledge of the scenario. Now, the other side of it, 
right, is just duty. Look, I'm about to be a dad in about a month, right, from the recording of this video. I don't know when this will be posted. I'm going to be a dad soon. You better believe that I am going to stand between an assailant, whether that is a dog, which I've had in my neighborhood a few times, or another human being, or a group of human beings, you better believe that I am going to stand between them and my children. Already, I have stood between a dog and my wife. Um, I am, you know, like, especially as men, we are almost genetically bound to be the protectors of our family. It has been our role as human beings since the division of labor, the division of the sexes started because we weren't the vulnerable ones. We are the more expendable ones, right? For genetic evolutionary reasons, right? One man can create many, many children all at once, whereas there's a limit to how many children a woman can create at once. Society would be uh, just easier to recoup losses uh, if the women are more preserved than the men, right? I don't like saying men are expendable, but to a genetic evolutionary sense, we kind of are. And now that doesn't mean that you should just throw everything away, but it's an important uh, principle to understand about why men have this certain instinct to stand in front of danger whereas others have more of a duty or a, an instinct to retreat because that's been our role just from the creating offspring the the mating the tribal aspect since time immemorial and so there is a certain duty whether you look at that as a genetic duty a moral duty an ethical duty you have a certain duty in some scenarios to stand in front of people and prevent harm. And again, that stepping in is going to be subject to all of this. You're just going to have one extra layer of justification because you're not acting in self-defense. You're acting in defense of others. So you're going to have to articulate all of this on top of the idea that the person that you defended could not effectively defend themselves. And that your intervention was the best opportunity for that. And look, you're going to have certain morals. Your personal morals and ethics are going to determine whether or not you intervene. And you just have to be willing to accept the consequences of that. And you have to be willing to fight and articulate in court, uh, you know, against your culpability in taking an action that it would be otherwise considered illegal. Um, so you just, you have to understand that there, there are consequences to your actions, whether you're talking legal, whether you're talking moral, something that nobody talks about except for like Rory Miller, I, I, others, you know, Mick Young talks about this. I'm pretty sure Lauren Christensen talks about this. Um, the aftermath of a conflict is oftentimes problematic, right? Because you go through this whole adrenalized thing and it can be psychologically traumatic especially if it leads to um you know grievous bodily harm or you know lethal force um there's a lot of aftermath that you have to deal with and you're going to be having to deal with authorities during that aftermath and that is going to be a very 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 challenging thing right so you you actually need a lot of kind of additional like training psychologically and legally counsel wise um, to be able to deal with use of force circumstances. And like, it's always hard to tell, did I make the right decision? It, because the, the future is completely occluded. Uh, humans are terrible predictors. Um, we are basically incapable of predicting things and it can always be nerve wracking to try to figure out what would have been different if I had behaved differently. So like understand that there is some psychological and, and uh, like moral, ethical, existential crisis fallout after a use of force scenario. So there is a lot to be said for this, right? So again, you can't 
be a vigilante. And there's also not much cause for it, right? Like, let's, let's get something out of the way. Violent crime is extraordinarily rare. And violent crime is kind of the only thing that you have justified use of force against. And it's extraordinarily rare. I covered this, you know, years ago, and I'm sure the statistics have updated since then. I haven't looked in a while, but like the proportion of violent crime to population, like the per capita violent crime in the United States, like was far less than 1%, far, far less than 1%. And the thing is like, if we mapped that out to say, well, you know, we know that people under report, if we assumed it was 10 times the reported amount, which would be absurd, but if it was 10 times the reported amount, it was still like 99% you're not going to be affected by violent crime. And the thing is that one of the things that we know about violent crime is that it tends to happen in places with known violent crime variables. And a lot of those things are detectable well prior to the kicking off point. And, you know, so it would do you no good to try to become a vigilante because violent crime is so rare that, I mean, you would spend all of your time, you know, I don't know, playing Tetris on your phone because you're bored on a stakeout because nothing's happening. You would need a sophisticated intelligence apparatus to even begin to look at something like that and you would still get it wrong. All of the intelligence agencies, all of the law enforcement agencies that we have in this country get things wrong all of the time. All of the time. Not only is our level of predictability absurdly bad, our level of being able to interpret warning signs and evidence is pretty extraordinarily bad. So again, you can't be a vigilante. You wouldn't want to be a vigilante and you don't need to be a vigilante. There are rare occasions where you may have to step in and intervene, but they are extraordinarily rare. And again, think about these laws of self-defense. Think about use of force continuum. Again, I will put a link to use of force continuum in the substack. And understand that you need to have the information. You need to have the intel in order to be able to act. And you just have to know if, like, are you in a position where you are duty bound, whether that is your job, obviously, if you are wearing a badge, well, actually, the Supreme Court decided that even if you're wearing a badge, you don't have a duty to act. That's a, another argument for another time. Um, but the thing is, like, look, if, if you are in a role as some kind of security or enforcement personnel, you have more of a duty to act than others do. And, um, and your morals may dictate that you intervene, but you have to understand that there are real consequences. And I will never stop repeating this. You have to understand that there are real consequences, whether you agree with them or not, whether you agree with the enforcement or not, whether you agree to the, uh, the entire apparatus that creates these standards and consequences for intervention is almost irrelevant to the fact that there are consequences for intervention. There are consequences for action. There are natural real world ones, the direct consequences of the thing, which you can argue are the only ones that really truly matter, but that's only from a moral framework. From a legal framework, there are also those artificial ones that are constrained upon us by whatever this broader thing we call society is, and those constraints do have consequences as well. So look, I'm going to tell you this again, you can't, you shouldn't be. You don't want to be a vigilante. You probably should not be intervening. In the case that you have to, in the case that you make the decision to, please be aware of these things. And I will talk to you later. Good journey. Thanks for watching. Like, subscribe, share. Check us out on our other socials. And please head over to blacksunboxing.com to get a little more info, including how to contact us. Furthermore, if you are in the Phoenix area, please feel free to stop in, say hi, join in for a class, whatever. Also, if you ever see us cite sources, 
um, or just for additional content, please check out our Substack. That is where we put all of the sources we use in our videos and is a major part of this. Plus it serves as a membership platform for long distance learning and for people who would like to support us but aren't local. Uh, we would greatly appreciate if you signed up. Even just the free membership helps us out a lot. All right, I will see you guys in the next video. Good journey.